Okay, thanks, Mohammed. I want to thank you for inviting me to this terrific meeting in this very exotic locale, which is <laughs> 10 miles away from my house. So um, what I'd like to talk today is about our mapping of uh, mitotic recombination events, both spontaneous events and those induced by having low levels of DNA polymerase. And uh, the purpose of this isn't just to keep us busy, but to try to get mechanistic information about how mitotic recombination occurs. So the summary of the talk will be that most spontaneous crossovers are actually induced by a double strand break in unreplicated DNA in G1 and then likely repaired in G2, that they're preferred sites for initiating a mitotic crossover, and at least one of these is a pair of inverted repeats, inverted transposons, that are separated by about 25 base pairs. I also want to make the point that the hotspots for G1-initiated events and G2-initiated events are different, as are the hotspots from two different homologs. And then finally, I'll be talking about the observations that low levels of DNA polymerase alpha elevate crossovers. And most of the events caused by low levels of polymerase, we think, are uh, initiated as a result of a break in S or G2. So there are two types of crossovers that one can think about in mitotic cells if you have a diploid. One is an exchange between the homologs, and if the two homologs are different, let's say there's SNPs that are distributed that distinguish this homolog from that one, then one effect of the crossover can be loss of heterozygosity of the markers distal to the point of the exchange. So after the crossovers, if we segregate this chromatid with this one into this daughter cell, now it's homozygous for the red sequence, and at the same time you'll make the other daughter be homozygous for the sequences that I've indicated in blue. On the other hand, if you have a crossover uh, between sister chromatids, as I've shown here, you don't get loss of heterozygosity. The genetic information in the sisters uh, is identical. And that, this point will become relevant as I discuss my data. So what you need then to map mitotic crossovers is first a way of distinguishing when you've had a crossover um, by loss of heterozygosity. And then secondly, you need markers distributed along a length so that you can detect where that event occurred. So the system that we've used to look for, to screen for crossovers uh, is the following. We look at this on the right arm of chromosome four. This is the longest arm in the yeast genome. It uh, contains about a megabase of DNA, which is about 10% of the yeast genome. So what we're looking at then is the frequency of crossovers between the center of chromosome four and a marker that we put out near the end of the chromosome, near the telomere. So what we've done is to construct a strain that on one of the homologs has a drug resistance marker. So cells with this marker are resistant to geneticin. And at the allelic position on the other homolog, we inserted a tRNA gene that encodes a nonsense suppressing tRNA. In addition, the strain is homozygous for mutation in AD2, and the important feature of, of uh, the AD2 gene for this talk is that when that mutation exists, the cells form uh, red colonies. This mutation, though, this particular mutant allele is an ochre mutation, and so that mutation is suppressible by this ochre suppressor. So in the starting strain, it's resistant to geneticin because it has that marker on that chromosome, and it forms kind of pink colonies because this suppressor, tRNA, uh, partially suppresses the AD21 mutation. So if we have a crossover between the centromere and these markers, what we generate then is one product which has uh, become homozygous for the drug resistance gene. So this cell uh, is resistant to geneticin, but it's lost the suppressor because that's segregated to the other product. And so this cell will be red and form a red sector. On the other hand, the other cell will be now homozygous for the suppressor and therefore will form a white sector. So if the event occurs at the time the cell is plated, we get a red-white sectored colony 
the uh, white half sensitive to jettison, the left half, the red half resistant. So that's a system that we use to identify crossovers. So how do we know where the crossovers occurred? Well, what we did was to um, generate the diploid by mating two haploids that had considerable sequence divergence. So one of the strains is a commonly used lab strain called W303. The other is a, from a clinical isolate called YGM789. They have that level of sequence divergence and that uh, results in about 55,000 heterozygous SNPs. And both of these strains have been sequenced, so we know that's uh, approximately the right number. So those are our markers. And before I tell you how we detect loss of heterozygosity, I just uh, want to tell you what we expected to find in this uh, experiment. So based on the textbooks, uh, mitotic recombination is supposed to occur in G2. And we thought that one thing we expected to get is now if these circles represent the SNPs, if we had a crossover at this point, and then we look in the sector colony, in one part of the colony, we would find heterozygosity for the SNPs up to this position, then homozygosity for the red form. Uh, the other sector would be heterozygous to the same position, and then homo homozygous for the blue form. And we expected this would be common. The other thing we expected was, as was alluded to by one of the other speakers, that often crossovers are associated with regions of gene conversion, so regions in which DNA is transferred non-reciprocally from one homolog to the other. So if that happens here, let's say we break on the road chromatin, it's been shown in many studies that what happens is information is then transferred during the gene conversion event from the intact donor into this molecule. So now one of the red SNPs becomes blue, and if that transfer of information is associated with a the crossover, then what you'd expect is when you look at the sectored colonies, you'll again find heterozygosity up to a particular point, followed by homozygosity. You'll see that in both sectors, but the transition between the heterozygous SNPs and the homozygous SNPs is different. And so the region I have drawn uh, in a box is the region of gene conversion. And we refer to these as three to one conversion events because if you consider all four chromosomes, they're now three representatives of the blue SNP and only one of the red. So we expected to see this type of event as well as this type, and we thought those might be the only two types of events. So before I describe what we really found, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the method we use to detect loss of heterozygosity. And so what we use are what are called SNP arrays. These, uh, we weren't the first people to use these, they were used by other people to look at loss of heterozygosity in somatic cells, and they've also been used in some yeast experiments. So let's say we have at a particular position in the genome a SNP, so that one chromosome has the A and AT, the other has a GC. What we did was to make 25 base pair oligos, uh, one pair that had Watson and Crick from this version, and then another pair that had Watson and Crick from this. And we put the SNP, the difference, right in the middle of that 25 base pairs. So the genomic DNA here is shown by the thick lines. So if you take DNA from a strain which is heterozygous, as is this one, and you denature the DNA and hybridize it to the microarray containing the oligos, if the strain is heterozygous, you expect it to hybridize, the genomic DNA will hybridize about equally well to all four of those oligos. If the strain has become homozygous for the black version, then it will hybridize better to these two oligos than to these two. And obviously, if it's homozygous in the other direction, it will hybridize better than to these than the other ones. And so by doing this uh, carefully, you can decide fairly unambiguously when you've lost heterozygosity. So here's the result of looking at one sector colony. So if we look at the red sector, what you see here is uh, shown is in blue is hybridization to what I'll call the blue SNPs, the ones derived from YJM789. And what's shown in red is hybridization to the other set of oligos. And you can see that from this point up to this, you see about the same signal, which I'll normalize to one. Then there's a separation in the signal such that the genomic DNA is hybridizing better 
to the red SNPs than the blue SNPs. These represent the uh, coordinates with the centromere being at about 450,000 going to the end of the chromosome, which is about 1.5 million. This represents the same analysis done with DNA isolated from the white part of the sector. And you can see again, a ratio of about one to this position, roughly the same, and then a separation in the opposite direction. And this is what we'd expect for the crossovers that I showed you before. So this is sort of a low res resolution look at this. This is a much higher resolution. And now each one of these squares and, and diamonds represents hybridization to an individual SNP on the microarray. And so what you can see here is that actually these two differ by the transition from heterozygosity to homozygosity. This strain has a transition at about this point, whereas this one has a transition about somewhere between here and here. And so this represents the region of the conversion, okay? So this represents a three to one conversion associated with the crossover. And we found those uh, events in about 30% of the events we, we looked at. So what are this, the other 70%? Well, they look like this. So uh, this is the low resolution look. And you can see here at about this position, both in the red sector and the white sector, they become homozygous for the blue SNP. Then in this sector, there's a second transition to become homozygous for red SNP whereas this one's becoming homozygous for blue. So there's an area then, which shows up better on, on this picture, where both sectored colonies have become homozygous for the same SNP derived from the YGM789 chromosome. Now there's a big gap between this position and this position, which I'll explain uh, in a few minutes. So what's going on there? How do you get that? How do you get these four to zero events? And we think that the simplest way of explaining them is they represent the repair of sister chromatids, two sister chromatids broken at the same position. So if you repair this one using this as a template and that break, that repair is associated with a crossover, you still have to repair this one. And if you repair that using either this chromosome or this chromosome, you wind up now with a what we call four to zero conversion tract associated with the crossover. So then the other question you can ask, well, is how do you get two breaks at the same position on those two chromatids? And we think the simplest explanation is that they represent the replication of a broken chromosome. So if you break this chromosome in G1, that broken chromosome replicates itself the sisters will be broken at about the same position. So we think that's our argument that uh, many of the crossovers that occur between homologs, those events are initiated by a break in G1. But I want to emphasize that the repair of that, those two breaks are in G2. Now we have other arguments in favor of this model, which I won't go into in detail, but for example, if you take uh, cells synchronized in G1, hit them with X-rays to introduce double-strand breaks, what we find then are these four to zero events. If we take cells that are synchronized in G2, treat them with X-rays, we find three to one events. So we're fairly sure that this explains uh, the data. So the bottom line from the talk so far is that we think three to one conversions reflect breaks made in either G2 or S that are repaired in G2 whereas the four to zero conversions reflect G1 breaks repaired in G2. So with that rather uh, lengthy introduction, I wanna talk about the, the mapping of events along chromosome four. And almost all this work was done by Jordan St. Charles, a uh, grad student in the, in the lab. So this represents the mapping of about 140 crossovers and their associated conversion events. What's shown on this axis is the number of times an individual SNP was involved in a conversion event. And if you look at this distribution, it looks fairly non-random with most of the events occurring in the middle third of the arm and fewer events occurring near the telomere and near the centromere. I've labeled a little bit arbitrarily hotspots one through five. 
And I'll be talking in more detail about Hotspot 2 and a little bit about Hotspot 1. So before I do that, though, there are a couple of other points I want to make. One is that we can um, look individually at whether it's the events initiated in G1 or G2 by the criterion I just talked to you about. And you can see the distributions are quite different. So in purple, we see what the G1 initiated events look like. And in green, these are the G2 initiated events, which seem somewhat more randomly distributed. In addition, the two homologs have different activities. So we can tell this by determining whether we get an extra blue SNP or an extra red SNP during the conversion event. And what you can see here in blue are the events initiated on the homolog originally derived from the strain W303. And in red, the uh, events initiated from the other homolog. So I want to point out that the HS2 hotspot appears to be specific to W303 and is also G1 specific. So what's responsible for making this double strand break? Well, this is uh, the analysis I've already showed you. This, when I showed you this 4 to 0 event, this was actually from one of the events at hotspot 2. And I mentioned there's this big gap. So why is there a gap between these SNPs and these SNPs? The reason is, if you look at the database, what's in that gap is a pair of TY elements. So these are retrotransposons. They're about a 6 kb element found in uh, about 40 copies or so per cell. And the reason we don't have any SNPs there is we can't make uh, oligos which specifically detect loss of heterozygosity at this position. So we think that this pair of TYs and in particular, the small distance that separates them, they're separated only by 25 base pairs, is required for making that double strand break. And that um, conclusion is based on a couple different arguments. One is that this pair of TY elements we found exists on the chromosome, the W303 derived chromosome, which has that hotspot, and it does not exist on the YGM789 chromosome. We showed this by a PCR analysis that I, I won't bother to go into. So YGM just has a truncated TY element, but it doesn't have this inverted uh, repeat structure. So to look at this in more detail, uh, what Jordan did was to insert markers that flanked hotspot two. So this represents the two TY elements. And in a way that I'm not gonna describe in detail, we can identify crossovers that have occurred between this gene and this gene. And if she looks in the wild type control strain, which has the intact FS2 hotspot, she gets a certain level of recombination. If she deletes out that TY element, then that recombination frequency goes down significantly. And if she increases the distance between those TYs from 25 base pairs to about 2 kb, the recombination event goes down significantly. So what we think you need here is an inverted pair of elements that are separated by a small distance. Now this is not entirely uh, surprising. There's data from a number of labs, Kirill Lobachev, Dmitry Gordinin, some work we did, that argued that repeats made artificially put into the East gen genome stimulate recombination. Uh, this is the first sort of natural uh, inverted repeat hotspot that's been described. So this is hotspot two, and how do we think it works? Well, we think the events are initiated in G1, as I, as I mentioned. And so one way of explaining it, <coughs> if this is the chromosome before replication, and these are Watson and Crick, we can imagine this event initiating by a single strand NIC in one of the TY elements. If that NIC gets expanded into a gap that goes across the spacer, <coughs> in theory it would be possible then for you to form one of these hairpin structures, where instead of pairing Watson and Crick, you have intrastrand pairing between the ends of the elements to form a structure like this. We think this is recognized as DNA damage by the cell. They nick that spacer, and then you'd have a double strand break, which when replicated would give you two broken sisters. So this is our working model. We, have, we haven't proven this yet. It seems to be uh, a reasonable explanation. <coughs> 
So that's hotspot two. What about the other hotspots? Well, this is hotspot one. It's a pair of TY elements. Now they're separated by about 100 base pairs, but it has a very similar structure, and so we're fairly convinced it's going to have a rather similar mechanism. The other point to mention, though, is that hotspots three, four, and five don't have that structure. They're not associated with TY elements, and we think those involve different uh, sequence motifs or uh, they're caused by something different. And we don't know the nature of that, but, but obviously we're interested in that issue. So um, one final point I want to make uh, concerning this part of the talk is just a comparison between the mitotic recombination maps and the meiotic recombination maps. So this is the data that I've just shown you on the mitotic events. This is data that is from uh, the lab of Monchero et al. looking at meiotic recombination events in the same interval, and we depicted it the same way. And um, we haven't done any fancy statistical analysis or any analysis at all, actually. But the patterns are, uh, I would say, evidently different. I should also point out that uh, the reason we chose Manchero's data to look at, although other people, including us, have generated um, meiotic data of this sort, is that his strain is almost isogenic with the one we used for the mitotic study. It, one of the haploids he used in making his strain is literally identical, and the other one's very closely related. So I think this comparison is going to be uh, a valid. So everything I mentioned so far has been about spontaneous recombination events. And what I'd like to talk about now are some uh, experiments that were done by Wei Song to look at crossovers that are caused by having low levels of DNA polymerase. I also mentioned that Wei is sitting right over there. And she has a poster on, on another subject that, um, is that tonight or tomorrow? Tonight. So um, as many of you know, if you have mammalian cells and you perturb DNA replication, for example, by treating them with an inhibitor of polymerase, you get uh, breaks in the chromosome called fragile sites. And we wanted to see whether we could mimic this in yeast. And so to uh, perturb replication, rather than using an inhibitor, which doesn't work that well in yeast, we fused the uh, gene encoding the catalytic subunit of DNA polymerase alpha, which is one of the replicative DNA polymerases, to a galactose-inducible promoter. So the idea then is when these cells are grown in low galactose, they have low levels of alpha polymerase compared to wild type. And that's shown over here, for example. This is the normal level <coughs> of alpha polymerase. This is what happens when you grow the cells in 0.005% galactose. They have roughly 10% the normal level. And if you grow them in 0.05% galactose, they have actually much more than they normally have. So what we investigated is what happens when you grow the cells in low levels of polymerase. And what we found was that it stimulated, excuse me, it stimulated crossovers considerably. So this is about uh, two orders of magnitude. And um, gratifyingly, when she looks at the types of events that you see, in spontaneously we find 70% that we classify as G1, 30% is SG2. In the events that are stimulated by low levels of polymerase, that, uh, that ratio reverses. So now only a minority of them are G1, and the majority of them are S or G2, as you'd expect if perturbing DNA replication caused breaks in, in S, let's say. Um, we're also looking at the distribution of these events, and um, what's shown in black are the events we see spontaneously, and what's shown in green are the events that were mapped by way uh, induced by low levels of polymerase. And again, there's quite a different pattern. And in particular, this peak near the centromere, um, I think is going to be interesting to look at what's there. So our current view of mitotic recombination, I should slow down a little bit, <laughs> maybe. So our current view of mitotic recombination is the following, that we think that spontaneous events are uh, probably caused by double strand breaks. And we think that double strand breaks occur both in G1 and in S or G2. 
we think, in fact, there are probably more events that occur in SRG2, and that's shown by this thicker arrow. However, when you get a break in G1 and you replicate that broken chromosome to get two broken chromatids, they can't officially repair themselves by sister chromatid exchange because the template is broken. So they can only repair themselves from the homolog. And so we think that's why we're seeing many events that have these four to zero conversion tracks. Um, on the other hand, even though there are more breaks that occur probably in S, we think that the majority of those breaks and probably the vast majority of those breaks are repaired using the sister as a template. And this sort of event is invisible by the assay that, that we use. However, a minority are repaired using the homolog and that's responsible then for the 30% of the events we see uh, associated with these three to one conversions. If you increase the flow of damage into this pathway by using low DNA polymerase, then we can start to see now more of these events relative to these. So I think that is pretty much all I want to say, except to point out the people. So this is Jordan, who did most of the work on mapping the spontaneous events. She had some help from Yi Yin in the analysis of these events. Wei Song, who I just pointed out. And Wei's talk, maybe I'll put in a little advertisement here. So Wei will be showing a poster um, in which she demonstrates that when you have a diploid cell that lacks the ability to undergo homologous recombination, it throws off its chromosomes until it becomes a haploid cell. And so that will be on her poster. And then these are other people from my lab. So I'll stop there and take questions. Thanks.